Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSPI podcast. Um, we're trying something new here. We're going to be recording these uh, uh, conversations because some of you apparently li- like to see our faces while we're talking. So on YouTube, you will be seeing our faces and on the podcast, it'll basically look normal. I'm here today with uh, Philippe Lemoine, uh, one of our research fellows. Uh, Philippe, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks. Yeah, so we're here to talk about your new uh, blog post, which has been getting a lot of attention. I saw Andrew uh, Gelman, the famous statistician, uh, talking about it um, uh, this morning. And so it's called, have we, been, have we Been Thinking About the Pandemic Wrong? The Effect of Population Structure on Transmission. Well, what's, the, what's the problem here with uh, how epidemiologists have been thinking about the pandemic? And, and what, are you, what are you trying to explain that they've, that, uh, what do you think explains it better? So I, I, I still start from, uh, you know, standard basic, standard epidemiological models, and I, I explain how they work, basically. And, 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 you know, those models, they predict that epidemics should behave in a certain way. You know, roughly, uh, you get exponential growth at first, like a lot of people get an increasingly high number of people get infected, uh, mm. until eventually you hit what, what people call the uh, herd immunity threshold, which is a point at which enough people have been infected that um, when someone who is infectious is like, you know, having contact with random people um, and uh, potentially infecting them, most of the pe- or, you know, um, most of the people that is having contact with, that is interacting with, that he might otherwise infect, have already been infected. So they're immune. They can't be infected anymore. At least that, that's the, how the model works. And, and, and so, you know, it doesn't transmit as well. It starts going down, you know, like each person who has been infected only inf- infects less than one person on average because of that. And at this point, you know, uh, the daily number of infections start going down. And, you know, eventually after a while, the, the epidemic just dies down. And this is how, you know, this is the standard model of how this is, you know, you, you have like some... Um, you, you can make some little changes here and there in the model, but, but, but you know, it, it has this basic, it's supposed to have this basic behavior. Now, of course, you know, this is what happens, what the model predicts when behavior doesn't change. So people, you know, there is no lockdown or people don't voluntarily change their behavior, stop seeing their friends or whatever, because they're scared, you know, they don't want to, to be infected or infect other people. Um, now, if you add to this model, some behavioral change, so you, you assume, for instance, there is like a lockdown at some point. And, you know, and you assume the lockdown is very effective, which, of course, is, you know, it's another story, but uh, I don't believe that's really true. But, uh, you know, suppose, it's, suppose it is true. Uh, and if you use the same model and it does that, uh, it's going to, you, you won't get the same behavior because before you can reach herd immunity, the, the lockdown is going to cut tr- uh, the contact rate, you know, so people won't be having as many contacts as before, and so they won't be infecting. When they're infectious, they won't be infecting as many people as before. They will be infecting, on average, if it works well enough, you know, less than one person. And so the epidemic will also go down as if we'd reached the herd immunity threshold, but we haven't. So what this means is that in those models, if you lift the, the lockdown and people resume their prior behavior, you know, they start seeing their friends again and whatever, uh, the incidence, you know, the daily number of infection, that's what incidence, it's called incidence, um, that's what it is, uh, is going to start blowing up again. You know, you're going to get like exponential or quasi exponential growth again. And, you know, and you're just, you, you've basically just delayed what, what would have happened. Otherwise, you know, it's going to keep growing until you reach the herd immunity threshold at which point it's going to, at which point it's going to go down and, uh, you know, until it just uh, dies. And, and so, you know, the, the idea was that ultimately behavior is a key variable here. It's the variable that determines how many people each infectious individual is going to infect. And so, you know, whether the behavior changes because of government interventions, you know, like in France, we were under uh, a lockdown or a curfew. So, you know, after a certain hour, if you were outside, you, you were fine and that sort of thing. That's one way you can change behavior. Like I said, you know, people uh, can and did have change their behavior voluntarily. So, you know, even in the absence of government interventions, people are scared and don't want to infect their friends or be infected. So they just don't see, they don't do the same thing as before. And it can like reduce the, um, it can reduce the, the, the number of people that each infectious person infects on average. But, you know, 
uh, the key variable in the, in the standard paradigm is supposed to be behavior. And, you know, there can be some other things like uh, meteorological variables um, also matter. You know, you, there are a number of papers that have looked at this and they do find an association between, um, you know, transmission and like the effective reproduction number of, of the epidemic, which is basically the average number of people that each infected person infect in turn. And, and you know, various meteorological variables. So, so there's an association. I'm not denying that, you know, but it's just like it's not very strong. And it, and what's really weird when you look at the data, so that's what I do in the one, one of the thing, uh, one of the things I do in the post at first, after I've explained how an epidemic was supposed to be to behave, you know, according to the standard models, I look at the real data and, and um, what you see is that you, you often have like large fluctuations. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you, I mean, sometimes like especially during the first wave, you can see mm. if you look at mobility data, which is the proxy we use for behavior, you, lose a, you, you look at mobility data, you see a sharp drop, sharp and sudden drop in mobility which indicates that suddenly, you know, people are really scared, so they change their behavior. And this mm. was accompanied with, by uh, a, a reduction, a massive reduction in transmission. Uh, and this was true in Sweden, where there was no lockdown. It was true in other places. Mobility data lockdown. is from Google, right? So, I mean, it's... it's yeah, 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 Google, it's, we, we have uh, similar yeah. data from Apple. Uh, we have we have also similar data from vendors that, that sell data, but like uh, bar and restaurant frequentation, that sort of thing. And also the same thing, you know. So yeah, yeah. there are certainly cases where, when there is a huge, you you have a, a huge drop in um, in mobility, and that's uh, as case, followed by a huge drop in transmission. And so the mm-hmm. standard theory looks like it it works fine on this. But if you look at all of that, especially after the second after the first wave, what you see that there are many instances where there are large fluctuation of the effective reproduction number, mm-hmm. but they don't seem to be explained at all. You know, they're not associated with any obvious uh, change in behavior. So if you, you know, one example I pick, but really there are, there are many, you know, uh, is Florida last summer where, yeah. you know, it's just like uh, there was a huge wave and then it went down. But it, if you look at mobility data, it doesn't look like people really change their behavior. Yeah. They, they didn't so, change their behavior a lot during the first wave, but... Uh, yeah, so the upshot of this is basically the mystery is the uh, behavior stays the same, but incidence goes up and incidence goes down and it doesn't appear obviously. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, ex- exactly. You know, you have the, so that's kind of like the, 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 the mystery uh, I'm trying to solve here is that you have exactly, as you say, you know, you have, you have huge variation in, uh, uh, in the epidemic curve, you know, it goes up and down, even mm-hmm. when behavior, as far as we can tell, is like really not changing. And so this seems to contradict the standard models where behavior is supposed to be the key variable. And, and you know, like I said, there are, of course, everybody acknowledges that there are potentially there are other factors like meteorological variables. But this is the same thing. Like sometimes you you, you see like very sudden uh, changes in um, in uh, tra- you know in the effective reproduction number, which governs the dynamic yeah. or summarizes the di- dynamic of the of the epidemic. But they're not associated with like any obvious, you know, change in the weather that we can that we can identify. And besides, mm-hmm. you know, those meteorological variables, as I note in the post, to the extent that they matter, they, they have both a direct and an indirect effect on on transmission. They have a direct effect because you know the uh, the biological transmission mechanism is is maybe directly affected by stuff like temperature and humidity because of the biophysics you know of the mm-hmm. of the, the the virus and how it's you know uh, enters cells and that sort of things or you know to, uh, stays in the environment or not this sort of thing and, and you know that's certainly that this probably exists uh, but you also have an indirect effect and this indirect effect that's the effect that the weather has on people people's behavior so if you don't see any change in behavior, you know, the, like the, all that indirect effect of uh, of the weather, in other words, of meteorological variables, it's already factored in behavior. You know, because it's like people are going to go out more, and like maybe it's trans the virus won't be transmitted as much because it doesn't work very well transmission outside outdoors. Right. Uh, you know, so my point is, yeah, that's that's the basic puzzle here. You see, and, and I'll explain why it's really a puzzle. It's like it's not just that you know, uh, standard models make. You know, according to standard models, uh, uh, 
behavior is really the key variable. And yet sometimes often we see those large fluctuation of the effective reproduction number that are not associated with any uh, change in behavior that we can see at least. And, and you know, why, the reason why it's really a puzzle is that like the, I say, you know, this is the assumption that standard models make, but it's it's obviously not crazy. In fact, it's the opposite of crazy. You know, this is a respiratory virus. It, it, it's transmitted because people get in close proximity to each other and, you know, and they inhale like particles, like small aerosols or droplets uh, that are being shed by uh, someone who is infectious, who's currently infected and like shedding viruses. And and that's how it's, you know, we, we know this, you know, there are many things we don't know, but we know that the basic mechanics of basic mechanism of transmission is that, you know, it's people getting in close proximity to each other. And so it's, it seems obvious that behavior should be the, the dominant factor here. So it's really weird, mm-hmm. you know, that we don't, you don't see this, that there's this decoupling between behavior and, and, and transmission. And given right. what we know about the basic transmission mechanism, it's, it's really weird, you know. So how can we explain this? How can we explain this decoupling without denying this basic fact about the transmission mechanism, which is that, you know, uh, a virus like this transmits because people get, you know, they get to each other, close to each other, like they have dinner together or whatever. And, you know, they, they shed some viruses that ends up inside the other person, you know, like that. That's, that's the mystery here. Okay. And how, and how do you solve it? Well, how do I solve it? So, uh, uh, so the idea I had, I mean, you know, that's not, I'm not like the only person who had this idea. Like I, I, I know several people have floated this idea around, yeah. but I guess for some reason it's, it has never been like taken really seriously. Right. I mean, well, maybe yeah, we can talk about that later. By... Doesn't read, uh, uh, medical journals and someone's just watching the news. This was the crush the curve thing, right? It's like, it's going to grow, grow forever. We're all going to die. And then it's going to go back. Yeah. And then they say, well, the behavior changes. And this is something you've written about too. You've written about behavioral changes. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And behavioral changes. So this is, this is true, but, st- but then there's a bigger mystery because, okay, it's wrong, but it's not behavioral changes, right? Yeah. yeah. So I what, mean, it's, what, not, just, wrong it's not just behavioral changes. Like I'm, I'm right. sure behavior also matters, you know, and, and I'm, Sure, you can explain some of those fluctuations, but then even when you you account for behavior, you're left yeah, with yeah. a bunch of very large fluctuation, large and sudden fluctuation, yeah. that yeah. it doesn't seem very plausible that behavior can explain because we don't see it at all in the data. It's very sudden, you know. I mean, um, so yeah, that's that's the and, and you know we have it seems it looks as though we have to square a circle here, which is that again. Uh, there seems to be this decoupling between behavior and transmission. And yet, based on what we know about the basic transmission mechanism, they should be extremely tightly connected to each other. So that's, that's really weird. And so the idea I had, and again, you know, I, I, like I said, you know, it's like uh, I, I've heard other people float this idea. It's just that for reasons we, we maybe will discuss later, it, it hasn't been taken seriously and like really explored in the scientific literature. Uh, you know, at least the applied work on the pandemic. Because uh, I'll explain this b- later, you know, but like the, there has been theoretical work on that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the idea is that, look, uh, if you go back to those standard models I was talking about, um, they make a key assumption or, you know, something very close to it. Because usually in applied work, you know, they, they don't quite make this assumption, but it doesn't really matter because they make an assumption that's for all practical purposes is very similar. And this assumption is called the homogeneous mixing population assumption. Right. And what it says is that um, when s- someone who is infectious, because he's been infected and right now is infectious, he's shedding virus, um, that person, everyone in the population, has exactly the same probability of being infected by that person. In mm. other words, you know, it's kind of like a billiard ball, like ideal gas model of human population. It's like yeah. you can see, it's as if like individuals in human population were like those particles bouncing at random like in this homogeneous medium and so they're hitting each other at random like billiard balls like the billiard balls like model of gas you know in physics and but you know and so you just have to state this hypothesis to see that it's completely unrealistic of course like it's not how it works like in effect if i'm like suppose that unbeknownst to me right now i were infectious uh in effect the probability that i will infect 99.999% 99.999% of the French population is zero because I will mm-hmm. have no interaction whatsoever with them ever. Yeah. 
This seems yeah. obvious enough. Why, why did why did epidemiologists believe this? So they don't. They know this. You know, they know this is not a, a realistic assumption. Close enough. It was good enough for oh. the model. Yeah, the hope is that well, you know, it's good. And like I said, you know, they don't quite make this assumption in 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 applied work. What they do instead is that they divide the population into several age groups. Typically, you know, typically yeah. they divide the population into several age groups, and then they they have surveys, you know, to estimate the contact rates between people in different age groups. Mm. And so they use those contact rates to see how much transmission there is, contact there is between pe- people in different age groups. So and then they, they, make have like, the, they have like five they make, categories of networks of homogenous networks. Is that it? Yeah. It's like you have, it's, it's, it's as if you have a network of like, uh, Everyone in your age group. six or seven, like different, uh, subpopulations that corresponds to the age groups and they're all connected to each other. But they have a different weight, you know. The probability of uh, that someone who is like in the over sixty age group is going to interact with someone in the twenty to thirty age group is a certain number, and like for right. a different other age groups, different. And but so you know, so it's not quite the but you know, but inside age groups, inside age, within age groups, then they make the homogeneous mixing assumption. So within, okay. so it's still the case that those models they effectively assume that. So me, I'm in the 30 to 40 age group, and they effectively assume that I have everyone, if I'm infect, infectious right now, uh, I have the same probability of infecting everyone else in this 30 to 40 uh, age group, yeah, which again is totally better. better. It doesn't sound much yeah, better. No, no it's, not, it's not much better. It's a, and in yeah. practice, you know, those models, the behavior that they predict, the epidemic behavior that they predict is very similar. So it doesn't make a... Uh, a difference on to the qualitative behavior of the epidemic. Uh-huh. So to answer your question, you know, like the, it's not that the, of course, the epidemiologists know it's not realistic. You know, they're not stupid. I mean, at least some of them aren't. Um, and um, but but the hope is that you know, in science, you often make idealizations. You know, like simplifying assumptions. You know, they're sure. false, but you know. The hope and and it's a it's a hope yeah. that's often realized. It makes the, it makes the math easier. It, 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 it makes the, yeah. It makes it makes the model like mathematically tractable. Yeah. Uh, and, and the hope is that in many cases it it won't really matter. You know, you'll still be able to. Uh, it, it will still predict pretty well the the phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, to you know, know that you have to have you have to know a little bit more math, and then you have to say, well, if I relax this assumption, this is pretty much you know foreshadow foreshadowing what we're going to talk about. What you do is you make the math a little more complicated, and then the point is you show, wait a minute, it looks nothing like it. It completely changes yeah. everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, of course, when you relax it, and it depends on exactly how you relax it. You know, you you can relax it a lot, but depending on the detail, you can still get something that's like close enough to, you know, to, to what you get. So, uh, with like the, the simple models, but, uh, but then you can also get something very, very different, you know? And and so, and so what's interesting is that again, it's not like when I say that epidemiologists know that, uh, I really mean, I mean, you know, I know some of them, certainly in France, I know some epidemiologists where you hear all the time in the media. And I know for a fact, they don't know that because I, Mm -hmm. I know they don't just don't know this literature at all, but uh, but you know, others definitely do it, know it, and um, and you know, there is a vast, there is a vast theoretical literature on this. Uh, yeah. So it's not, it's not something like the the theory. It's not something new. Um, there is a vast yeah. theoretical literature on the spread of not just infectious diseases, but in general, like social phenomena, like you know, rumors yeah. or um, um, you know, fashions, that sort of things. Uh, all this spread on a complex network. And this is a literature that isn't limited to epidemiology of infectious diseases. You also have like sociologists working on that. You have physicists. A lot of this stuff comes from uh, mathematical tools that were developed by physicists um, uh, to study like condensed matter and all sorts of things. Uh, where uh, you know networks actually matter. Yeah, often um, I mean, when you hear the science you hear about in the media, I mean, it's often just. You know the tip of the iceberg, right? There's this vast yeah, yeah, literature that exactly. like 99.9 percent of but, journalists and the public will will never but, see, and there's like good stuff in there, but it's like sometimes 
but you know you're going to see a small small snap. So I, I think you know I saw on the Gelman uh, blog today when he shared your thing, you said something like you know the way we think about these models. And someone in the comments said, "Oh, who's thinking about this?" I googled on Google Scholar and I saw people talking about population structure. And like, sure, someone in the universe has talked about the epidemic and population structure. But if you just read the New York Times, if you just read you know, the Wall Street Journal, if you just follow the major epidemiologists on Twitter, basically it's homogenous. It's homogenous mixing, right? It, it, but, there's, yeah, there's, there's, and. and, and you know, it's actually worse than that. It's much worse than that, actually, because uh, what this guy was talking about, I, I replied to this guy in the comments, you know, it's true, you know, m maybe we can discuss that later, but uh, there has been a debate. So some people who are listening to this, they may remember that there was a debate about heterogeneity in general and what roles it plays in the epidemic process last year. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have seen, you know, like they're vaguely aware of that stuff. And so they see my post and they think, oh, this is what he's talking about. But no, really, it's a different thing I'm talking about. And and maybe I'll explain later. But I just want to point out that what all the, the two articles that this guy uh, uh, talked yeah. about in the comments of the Gelman post, for instance, uh, they're actually things, uh, uh, they're actually papers that, you know, are very interesting, but they're just on something completely different from what I'm talking about. Okay. And the so, guy just yeah, doesn't so know it. Because... your contribution and, and, and what, what you so, do. Uh, but it, like, you know, I, I, again, I want to say them, um, uh, going back to what you were saying, it's not just that, you know, it's not just in New York Times and whatever. So what I'm talking about, there is this vast theoretical literature on the spread of infectious disease on complex networks. And, and you know, epidemiologists have contributed to it, contributed to it and physicists have done so socially, et cetera. So they, a lot of them know this stuff. But the problem is that, as far as I can tell, and I am, you know, I've, I have followed this literature quite closely, uh, it has played virtually no role in the applied work on the COVID-19 pandemic. So you have, you know, they're aware of this possibility theoretically. You know, there's a lot of theoretical work, more than theoretical, uh, more than theoretically. Uh, but th there's a lot of theoretical work that's been done on this, which is like really interesting and really good. But... In practice, it's not just in the New York Times. Even in the scientific literature yeah. on the pandemic, it has, in the applied work at least, it has played virtually no role. So, and like JAMA, if you see Journal of American Medical Association, they're not they're, they're not even aware of the stuff that happens in different journals. Or you you cite one paper in your uh, report, which is just basically it's been cited only a few times, right? It's got no attention at all. So yeah, yeah, often, that's, that's it, the, the, yeah. The attention is no. Uh, you know, has very little correlation with merit often in academic literature, either within academic literature or what gets, what sort of breaks through outside of academia and gets into the broader public. I mean, so. Yeah, you, ha you have the filter, you know, I mean, you have a first filter, uh, you know, within science itself of, right. you know, in this case, I think the reason why they feel, I mean, one of the reasons why the theoretical literature mm -hmm. has not been, uh, has not played any role or basically no role uh, in the, um, in the applied work on the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, it makes everything a lot more complicated. And I think very often if you if you take that stuff into account, then all they would have been left uh, to say would be, you know, we don't know, you know, oh, what, you know, they're, be they're being asked, you, you have to understand, like a lot of those guys, they're under a lot of pressure in a way because they're being asked by decision makers for advice, for, you know, policy relevant advice. And, and, you know, if you take into okay. account... Before, the story, before we go down this rabbit hole, before we talk about science and what's wrong with it, well, you, I think you still have been explaining yeah, exactly... Yeah, I should, I should start explaining what I think. So, so, you know, okay, uh, let me rewind. You know, I was talking about how they make this assumption or something close to it, which is that uh, the population is homogeneous mixing, which means, again, that, you know, when someone is infectious, he has basically the same probability of infecting everyone else in the population, and that's totally not realistic. That's not realistic because in practice the population is structured in social networks. You know, like for instance, if I were infectious right now, um, like I said, there is almost no one, uh, the probability that I will infect 99.999999% of the French population would effectively be zero because I never have any interaction with them. But then there are a few people I do have interaction with them on a regular basis, like my friends, uh, you know, my neighbors, or actually my neighbors not so much, but, you know, um, People, you know, work at the supermarket where I, I buy my groceries. That's, but, you know, mostly my friends, basically, and family. Um, and those are people that I do have interaction with. So if I were infectious, they would have a non-zero probability of being infected by me. And they, in turn, have their own friends, which don't entirely overlap or sometimes not at all with sure. mine. 
uh, their own like uh, you know colleagues, you know, etc. And, and and if you if you so if you look based on people's like patterns of interaction, you can imagine that the population you can imagine the population as a a network where the nodes in the network are individuals, and the edges connecting nodes are uh, potential interactions with it between them. And you can also imagine that on those those edges, you associate with them uh, uh, a number which corresponds to a weight, you know, which corresponds to the probability that they will have an interaction. Those two nodes will have an interaction during the infectious period. So it's not always the same because, for instance, there, I have some close friends. I see them often. So for yeah. them, the weight is going to be pretty heavy, you know, because I'm, I see them often. If I'm infectious, there's a fair chance I'm going to have an interaction with them and I might infect them. But then you have, say, the the lady who works at the supermarket when I buy my groceries. Uh, in in her case, you know, the probability is much smaller because although I do see her, it's not like my friends. You know, I don't see her as often, and you know, it's not as when I do see her, it's pretty short interactions. You know, I don't spend like I don't stay like thirty minutes at the uh, talking to the cashier or whatever. Um, so you can imagine a population like this, and so in reality. Um, the virus, the way it spreads, is it doesn't spread at random in the population. You know, there are certain paths. There are only certain paths it can it can take to spread, and the probability of some of those paths is much higher than the probability of some of the others. You know, and and so what what I was you know so you you look at the going back to the data you know you look at the data and you see that the epidemics. Even when there is apparently no change in behavior, is is you have those large waves that go that start, you know, and then they fall all of a sudden. You don't know why, and then yeah. you know a bit later they start again. Or sometimes you have those huge, very long plateau like they've had yeah. in England for the past four months, where you know, like it's been this long plateau uh, at very high level of incidence with like some ups and down, you know. Uh, and so I see this, and I'm like, okay. My, so what I was I was thinking about, okay, what might explain this, you know? And 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 my idea was, um, maybe you know, maybe this huge network I was talking about, you know, the population uh, formed by its people's patterns of interaction, maybe this network has something that in network science they call community structure, which means that there are some parts of the networks. So some collection of nodes that are well, very well connected with each other. So you have lots of edges between them. And then, you know, but, you know, and then some in some other parts of the graph of the network, there is another collection of nodes where that is like very well connected yeah. internally. But then so they're I only mean, in like a population. So you can imagine like they're, uh, this in real life, what's this look like? So maybe there's ethnic communities, right? Muslims interact with other Muslims. You have families, you have extended families, uh, you have college students, you have communities, you know, centered around institutions, right? And sometimes these you know communities can have nothing to do with each other at all, right? Yeah. And sometimes the connections are very weak. One person who, you know, goes to college might be connected to the, you know, Muslim community or Jewish community or whatever. So you're, you're not, you know, you, 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 I mean, you do something that technically what you do is very fascinating because you allow for all different kinds of sizes, right? You have, you have them going from, you know, the small communities. Like, what are the smallest, like in the, in the tens? And then you go up to like, don't you go up to like a million or something like that? It's like, uh, so at, at the very basic, because I mean, I, I, I should talk about this a bit later because there is some kind of like trick I use to make the problem like computationally tractable. And, okay. and, and oh, that's okay. okay. Then just go on ahead on your, on your path. So, okay. so let me just finish like, you know, you with this idea where you have some parts of the network where like that is some connection of nodes that are internally like very well connected to each other because they're like you said, you know, maybe there's the same school or, you know, they're uh, families and networks of families and friends or like ethnic community. I mean, I, I think it can, you know, it's fractal. You have communities within communities, you know, uh, but you know, you can imagine there are some parts of the, uh, of the huge network of the whole population where internally it's very well connected. And then some other parts where it's the same, it's internally very well connected. Uh, but so internally, those parts of the network are very well connected, but they're only loosely connected to each other. You know, that's at least that's a possibility. We we don't know. You know that's an empirical question. What the the huge network looks like, but at least it looks like a not not like a crazy hypothesis. You know, based on the sort yeah. of consideration that you just that you just made. You know, like people are 
are they have different like communities of friends and families and and schools and etc etc and so um and so if you have this you effectively have this huge network um you can think of it as um a collection not just one big homogeneous mixing population as a standard model assumes you know but instead you can imagine that it's like uh, a collection of like several thousands of uh, networks, parts of the network that really aren't quite homogeneous mixing, but mm-hmm. they're so well connected internally that, you know, we can make the idealization that they are in effect like a uh, homogeneous mixing population. And, right. you know, this is what I do. I, I assume that, you know, you have those communities that are like, internally well-connected enough that it's as if they were homogeneous mixing, although even those communities are not quite homogeneous mixing. And, and so what you end up with is like this huge network of, of several, like you, you, the, effectively the population is divided into dozens of subpopulations corresponding to those small networks. And those small networks are themselves connected to each other and they form like networks of networks. And then those networks of networks uh, are only loosely, loosely connected to each other. And you have, so you have those kind of like uh, uh, clusters of, 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 of networks uh, and subpopulations only loosely connected to each other. And so the intuition behind my, the theory that I like explore in this post for how, why, you know, even when behavior doesn't really change, you can have those wild fluctuations of the, number of infection, daily number of infections and reproduction number is that basically what happens is that the virus, one of those uh, parts of the graph that are very well connected internally gets seeded by the virus and the virus starts spreading inside that community. And it's fairly easy because again, we're talking about communities where there are lots of ties, you know, and if, by the way, for, for, for listeners, I mean, or, or watchers, if you, um, uh, there are pictures that sort of make this, I think, clearer and figures and graphics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, so it's a bit. If you're having trouble sort of following along, I mean, if you probably listen and follow along, it's probably better, but continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you should definitely, like, uh, have a look at the pictures. I, I do think it helps understand this. So, you know, what I think is, is happening, or at least maybe happening, is that uh, some of those communities get seeded by the virus, you know, just like whatever, uh, someone, you know, for instance, there's, there was an outbreak in India, a very large un- outbreak in India, where the, the Delta variant came from. And, you know, so there was lots of people in India getting con- contaminated. So some of them, tr- you know, traveled and, and, you know, by chance or, you know, bad luck in this case, um, one of them, you know, hit your community and like, and the, the virus starts spreading in there. And so, like I said, though, internally, those communities are well connected, so it, it can spread pretty easily in that community. But then in, in the theory that I'm like exploring in that post, uh, they're only loosely connected to each other. So it's spreading very easily inside that community, but it may take a while before it can reach another of those communities, or it may yeah. never be able to do it. Sure. Uh, sure. And so what happens if, if, you know, if, if this is what happens, it would explain why, you know, all of a sudden, you know, a wave starts. Why does it start? Well, because some community of lots of people are susceptible to in- to in- infection just happen to be seeded by the virus, and the virus starts spreading in that community, and it has a fairly easy time uh, of, doing, of doing it, you know. And then eventually, herd immunity is, is reached locally in that network, and it starts, you know, incidence starts going down. And then when, when or even before that, what can happen is that either the virus manages to escape this from this community and reach another one and then it can spread in that other one and you know that maybe you have a second wave or you know you, the first wave continues or you know it was looking like it was going down but no it, it goes back up again as we've seen in many in many cases on in real data or what can happen is that it, it's trapped in that community it doesn't manage to get out because there is not enough connectivity between this community and other communities and and so herd immunity is reached locally incidence goes down and it's the end of the wave until a bit later, or sometimes not a bit later at all, some other community is seeded by the virus, you know, and it, start, it starts another wave. And then you're 
you know, you're back on that ride again, and yeah. the same thing can happen. So it's, it's sort of like it's sort of like countries. I mean, we think about countries as isolated units, and then people see in some countries it goes like this and that. But if you just assume that sort of the countries are not connected to each other, right? You you don't expect you know the wave in France to be correlated with the wave in America. Um, although, you know, it might be in, in reality, but generally, you know, we understand epidemiology and people who follow these things understand that there's no, you know, these are different communities. So you'd expect different uh, uh, dynamics and you'd expect different patterns. But within um, uh, within a country, it's sort of like, you know, populations can be thought of as different countries and communities. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's like we should. Yeah, be yeah, that's, that's exactly. So that's like in, in my framework, you know, I, I, I do use the. I do like ask people to pretend that I'm modeling one country, but really yeah. in my in my framework, um, it's international. Yeah, uh, it's it, inter- it, you know the the only thing that that makes a country special is that the the communities within the countries are more connected on average than the communities yeah. in different in the same country than in the com- the communities in different countries. But you know, right. really in reality, there are connections. But you know, otherwise the, the the virus wouldn't be spreading. You know, it would have stayed in Wuhan. You know, which which of course is not what happened. Uh, yeah. and so, and you know, you can, um, like I said, I, I, I try to model this as one country, but I could, you could even like, and you know, and I see the, the virus from the outside in the simulations that I do. Uh, but you know, if I wanted, it wouldn't be very difficult to use that same framework and make seeding, uh, like the jargon is endogenous. What I mean is that, uh, Instead of modeling just one country with like all the communities inside it, right. I could right. model like several country yeah, and see just, how. It's just about the networks. It's just about changing the. Yeah, it's, it's just, just about, it's just like yeah. uh, enlarging the network, and so you can yeah. see how different, co- like uh, an outbreak in one country is going to seed communities in another country, and starts outbreaks over there, and 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 then right. you know it can spread that way, and and you know that explains you know in the post I also show how. Um, this can not only explain, you know, this 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 uh, theory can not only explain why uh, uh, even when behavior is just doesn't change, you can get this wave, you know, going up and down, but also explains why, or at least it can explain. You know, again, we don't know if that's actually true, but um, but it could explain why uh, uh, waves are correlated across regions. You know, like because even you know even in my simulation, I assume that those networks of communities they are heavily concentrated you know in 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 one region but you know they have they have some connection to other region and this is enough you know like because they have some connection to other to communities in in other regions you get this correlation between of waves across regions and it's actually pre- i was surprised by this actually like I, I i really assume like very little that it was heavily concentrated in one region those those big communities that are internally very well connected, but only loosely connected to each other. Mm-hmm. And, and and nevertheless, you know, just a little bit of communities, of connection of like communities in other regions, that was enough to get something that, that looks a lot like what we've seen. Again, yeah. you know, I want so to... Like I want in like to... France, so in like France, for example, you see the waves are correlated across the region, right? So yeah. the north of France and the south of France will have, you know, uh, if one of them has a, is on the increase, the other one will be too, right? And yeah, yeah. So it's get, like... Yeah. And that makes sense if there are, and that makes sense, right? People have different like networks, they have families, they have uh, uh, professions, they have like hobbies and associations. And, you know, uh, so it makes sense that you would see correlation across, like you, know, you just think of a university where people from, you know, the U S different areas come together. Um, and there's a, you know, university community, it's connected to a lot of other places. So th- this makes, this makes sense. And it's just the empirical question like how much region matters, like how much of a barrier is region to uh, uh, to sort of mixing between people. And it's a something yeah. of a barrier, but it's, it's not, you know, a perfect barrier. So, so we, we just don't know where we are. And all we can do, I guess, is design these models and plug the numbers in and, and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So the, the uh, you know, I, I do want to stress that I, I do that in the post, but I'm, I'm going to do this here too, that this is speculative work, you know, I, I'm, what I'm doing is yeah. I'm looking at, I start, I mean, I do start from real data. You know, I, I start from, I start from real data and I start from the, the standard models. And I see that the way in which the real data behave, uh, doesn't match what the standard model predicts. So I'm like, okay, uh, just describing my process here. I'm like, okay, well, what could explain this? And, and, you know, and, and then, you know, I think about the fact that, you know, if you think about the way in which the virus really spreads, 
it's on this network. And I'm, I'm beginning to think about what kind of structure would this network need to have to explain the kind of, of uh, things we see in the real data. And that's how I came up with this uh, uh, theory that I described in the post. But it is speculative in that I don't have, I don't have data on the, the structure of the actual networks. So maybe, yeah. maybe the actual network doesn't have the structure that I assume in my simulations. It's possible. Uh, what I do here is I just want to show to people that if it does have this structure, it would explain a number of things that are otherwise very puzzling. Mm -hmm. And so what I hope is that it will motivate people to collect data that would allow us to tell what structure the network actually has and see if based on that structure, we can recover the you know, the actual epidemic behavior that we've seen, you know, when, why waves went up when they did. And, you know, is this something that makes sense given the actual structure of the, of the network? And, but, you know, this is not something that I can do because I don't have access to like, uh, you know, cell phone company tracking data sort of things. But there is one study uh, that I mentioned in the post that, you know, so they weren't, this study doesn't look at the, at community structure, but I, I, I talked, you know, the uh, I talked with the author. So they, they use uh, GPS tracking data from like a million cell phones in Germany, and they were able to reconstruct a, a network. And it does have community structure, like the sort of structure that I suppose in in my post. But then it's really tricky to interpret this, you know. And it, so it, uh, my point here is just I say that, uh, you know, he sent me a picture that looks an awful lot like the the picture of the graph that I generated randomly for my simulation uh -huh. that I, that you can find in the post, you know, it's actually pretty impressive. I didn't yeah. put it in the post because he asked me not to share it, but it's, uh -huh. it's pretty cool. Uh, but you know, it doesn't mean I want to say, you know, it doesn't mean that, uh, my, my theory is true because the, the structure that he can see in his data, uh, I mean, their data, there are several of them. Um, it's it's difficult to interpret, you know. Like it's it's very difficult. So is there? I, I know they're working on it right now. So maybe you know they will come up with something that will either you know confirm or disconfirm my theory. Uh, and you know, hopefully, hopefully this will encourage more people to to get that kind of data and try to look into this into the the role that population structure might play. Because as I said before, the problem right now is that it's not just again in the media. It's not just the New York Times, etc. Like even in the scientific literature, at least in applied work. Uh, population structure, again, beyond, you know, age group, dividing the population into age groups hasn't really played any role, basically. And, and so, in, you know, in applied work. And so, and this is a problem. It's a problem because, uh, as I explained in the post, or projections, you know, so mm. governments, they make decisions in part based on the inputs from modelers who give them projections, you know, like what's going to happen if you do this or don't do this in the next month or so. And, and you know, as I've discussed several times on, on you know, in, in stuff I've written for CSPI before, uh, those projections have been pretty terrible. But I mean, you know, I, I think this is becoming increasingly not controversial. You know, yeah, it's, it's starting to be learned, so. Have they learned? Because when I hear them talk now, they say, "Oh, we're going to have maybe a wave because of you know the Christmas season," and they don't. No, no, I, they haven't learned at all. It's like it's it's uh, honestly it's. Uh, but they, but they don't assume anymore that it's going to continue forever until it hits everyone, right? They're assuming. I mean, they they they, ha, they know the. Um, I don't know. Well, I don't know why they think it like they. I don't know if they take into account in their minds implicitly. They take into account uh, behavior. I don't know if that's it or its networks. But they they do understand at least that the the initial. You know, when we were started talking about epidemiology at the beginning of all this, at the beginning of COVID, it was like R naught was like the scientifically, you know, concept. Like it was like the it was like the temperature at which water boils. It was just something that like diseases had, and I, I see people don't talk about that anymore. And it was very naive. Um, it was very naive that we would just be going, you know, up. The numbers would go up forever until herd immunity. And I don't know if they've replaced it with any model in their head, but they at least know the patterns you're talking about. I mean, like, you know, if you, if you look at, like, if I if I look at the the applied literature I know best, which is the one about France for obvious reasons, because I was directly concerned about it, um, I can tell you, you can see their evolution. You know, at first, their first model, there's nothing about, like, voluntary behavior. It's just like, they just assume that, you know, um, uh, non-pharmaceutical, you know, government interventions... 
uh, totally control people's behavior and that they're the only thing that's going to yeah. have any effect, you know, on the dynamic of the epidemic. And then, you know, uh, like, you know, earlier this year, they finally started to take more seriously behavior. But, you know, I say take it more seriously, but that's bec- it's not saying much because before they weren't taking taking it into account at all. So taking it right. more seriously, all you have to do is take it in taking taking it into account at least a little bit yeah. and so the way they do it they just make those it's ridiculous i mean it's this stuff it's really it's really total sort of science i mean what they do for instance that they look at how uh the reproduction number changed um uh you know in the past and they assume oh, this has to be the effect of the lockdown and when it when there was a lockdown you know and when there was no lockdown so oh, this has to be the effect of voluntary uh behavior change and, and, you know, and they assume it's going to be the same the next time in their projection. And they make those. And it's just, I mean, honestly, if, if people really knew and understood how those things work, there'll be riots in the streets. You know, it's really <laughs> lucky. It's insane. This is every field. This is, I mean, this yeah, is yeah, every I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, but in this case, I agree it's every field. But in this case, it has impacted people's life, like, in a much more direct way than usual for those things. You know, because, like, I, in France, people are, like, for right. months, you know, we had to go back at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Or, you know, we'd be fine if we were outside. It's like, you know, it's just like, it, it, let's just say this is a kind of of, uh, of bullshit that has had uh, a much more direct and massive impact on people's lives than the usual bullshit you find in, in, in academia. So Yeah, uh, that's true. They, they do, you know, they, so they did, you can see, you know, again, like you, if you look at the literature, at least like, like the one I, I know best, but, I, you know, I've, I, I haven't read, I've read a lot of stuff, not just about France, and it's very similar. They do progressively uh, add more comp- some of those complications, but if I'm right that population structure plays a key role, uh, they're just adding epicycles on fundamentally flawed models, basically. Mm. So it doesn't really help, you know, and indeed it hasn't really helped because their projections have remained absolutely terrible. I mean, you know, they were terrible at first, and honestly... Again, if I look at the ones I know best, the, the French case, they were really no less terrible more recently than they were one year ago. So, yeah. you know, one possible explanation is that I'm right that population structure is a key factor here. And and so what they're doing when they add all those complications that they're just adding epicycles to a fundamentally flawed theory. And that would be one explanation. Or maybe, you know, my theory is wrong. There is some other explanation, but one thing that's for sure is that their projections are shit. And uh, yeah. so, you know, uh, it, it's, um, and, you know, it's, it's, here's another reason why it's a problem is that it's not just, a, so I, as I just said, you know, it affects the projections. If, if I'm right and population structure is a key factor, then your projections are going to be completely off. Even if you add all those complications, it's not going to help if, if I'm right and population structure has this really important role. Another way in which it may have um in which it may have uh made things bad is that um if you look at the literature so, you know, there's been like uh governments around the world have uh done all sorts of interventions to try and contain the spread of the virus right or slow it down or mitigate it whatever and and you know there's a vast you know, empirical scientific literature on, on the effects of those interventions. And as I explained in the post, is uh, implicit, more or less implicitly, implicitly or explicitly, you know, very often it's just implicit, uh, those studies, the statistical techniques that they use to estimate the effect of government interventions on the spread of the virus, uh, they implicitly or explicitly assume homogeneous mixing. So if I'm right that, yeah. in fact, it's not just, so it's there is no dispute that homogeneous the homogeneous mixing assumption is false. The the dispute is about how much it matters. And if I'm right that it matters a lot, uh, then I, one thing I show in the post is that it it makes the uh, statistical methods that are used in the scientific literature to estimate the effect of those interventions completely unreliable, because those methods. Again, implicitly or explicitly, they start from the assumption that the population is homogeneous mixing. And if it's not, uh, it, it messes everything up. So what I do in the what I do in the in the post, you know, if people read it, 
you'll see that what I do is I, I take my simulations that assume that the population is not homogeneous mixing and that, you know, you have those networks, those communities are internally very well connected, but only loosely connected to each other. And I generate epidemics with this and you have this, this pattern that I we've talked about, you know, those waves that's, you know, and in my simulation, I assume that behavior doesn't change. So it's, but even with behavior that doesn't change, you get those waves that come and go as we've seen in, in the real world. And what I do is that I take the data that have been generated by this model and I, and I, I feed it to the models that have been used to estimate the effect of government interventions. And I tell the model, okay, this is, here are data, here are real data. Of course, they're not real data, they're simulated data. And I tell them, I lie to the model. I tell them, oh, I tell the model, here at this point, there was a lockdown. And I want you to estimate yeah. the effect that this lockdown had. In fact, there was no lockdown. You know, in, By assumption, in my, in, mo in my simulation, there was no lockdown. There was no change of behavior, whether forced by government or voluntary. But I tell, I, I tell those models, I give them those data, and I tell them there was a lockdown. So, of course, the real effect of the lockdown was zero because there was no lockdown. <laughs> but I, tell, I, give the, I feed those data to the model, and I, tell, I tell, ask the model, okay, tell me what, what was the effect of this lockdown, and it finds a huge effect. You know, which of course that was the yeah. real effect is zero. And so, and I, and I show this for two classes of models, two different class, very different classes of model that use a completely different approach to estimate the effect of this intervention. And it's the same result in both cases, which yeah. makes perfect sense. You know, it's it's intuitively it's very easy to understand if you assume that the population is homogeneous mixing. As I said at the beginning, the only thing that can slow down. Uh, the uh, uh, the growth of the epidemic. There are only two things: either you hit the herd immunity, and you know the epidemic eventually dies down because there is no one left to infect, mm. or there is massive change of behavior, or you know whether forced or voluntary. So in that case, I would be forced, you know, by a lockdown, and so people like don't have as many contacts as before, and so the epidemic transmission goes down. So if you if if a model that assumes homogeneous mixing gets you give him you give it data where you have the wave that falls long before the herd immunity threshold is reached for the model because it assumes homogeneous mixing the only possible way this could happen is if the lockdown had a massive effect so it's going to infer that the lockdown had a massive effect because that's the only way this model can explain the data otherwise it can't explain it and and yeah. you know this is not those models that I'm using, it's not stuff that I made up. You know, I mean, I did, I, I did write those models, but they're based. You know, it's it's the exact same models. You know, or a variety. It's a variety of the the exact same models that have been used in the literature. You know, those things have actually been used. That that is what I just described. That is exactly what virtually every study, including the most cited ones, uh, on the effect of government intervention has have been doing. Has been doing. That's, yeah. this, this is exactly what they've been doing. So, so if I'm right that population structure uh, plays a key role in transmission, th those studies are like are totally unreliable. Yeah. So you yeah. may you may say, okay, but we don't know that you're right, and yeah. I agree, we don't know that I'm right. But it's more consistent it's, with, it's, with it's, the, it's, the data. It's more it's more consistent with the data, and even if you put that aside. It's certainly not crazy, you know. It's not, as you yeah. said before, you know, actual population. They are, they, you know, they are. There are those networks that exist. We know there, you know, what's the overall structure of the network? That's another question. But it, it's, you know, it's not a crazy hypothesis. So even if, you know, maybe it will turn out to be false. But the mere fact that it might be true that we have good reasons to think that it, that it might be true, that should make you feel really uncomfortable about. Uh, the conclusions of all those studies that we have, you know, we have based like a lot on those studies. We we yeah. have we have completely, you know. So besides, so besides that, besides, uh, how would policymakers? How would they change if they adopted your view? So they would not take the 
uh, studies on the effectiveness of NPI seriously on um, non pharmaceutical interventions. Is there is there any are there any other implications? Because both the behavioral model and the uh, network model predicts uh, superficially the same thing that you're going to see waves and you're going to see them go up and you're going to go down even without herd immunity. Um, so well, you know what what else are the policy implications besides the? Uh, 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 I the, mean, look on on in the case you know. It, the, the behavior, like the, the voluntary behavioral change theory, it only predicts this if people actually change their behavior. But, yeah. you know, we, we don't know that they will. I mean, you know, I think if things got really bad, it's pretty clear that they would. But it could get really, you know, the, the point is that if you, if you on the behavioral, uh, voluntary behavioral change theory, or, you know, uh, any theory that gives a lot of weight to behavior, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions make more sense. I'm not saying that they make they automatically make sense. You know, I've discussed right. this a lot, but they at least make more sense because they still start. You know, this theory still starts from the assumption that behavior is the it, thing that really matters here. Yeah, okay. And so, it, you know, uh, uh, you know. So, whereas if it's if population structure is the main factor, then really it 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 means that. I mean, no, it doesn't. Again, my theory is not inconsistent. And in fact, I do believe that behavior plays a role, you know? So it's not, I'm not saying here that uh, behavior plays no role. But if it's a big factor, if population structure is a really big factor, or even the main factor, it, it, it really breaks this illusion of control that people have had, you know, where governments think that they, they, they can control most of the, you know, because what it means is that they should like relax because no, yeah. what they do is mostly going to harm people by reducing their well-being, but it's not going to have that much of an effect on the, on the epidemic. Well, that um, might be because you can control social, if you make a curfew and you say people can't leave their house after 6 PM, yeah. then the, it, it could hit their networks, right? If their networks are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah like, so that's another complication. Like uh, one thing I briefly discussed in the post, uh, not only are those things not inconsistent, but in fact, uh, all this stuff about networks and population structure, it interacts with uh, government interventions, but also voluntary changes of behavior. Because if people change their behavior, whether because they're forced by the government or voluntarily, it's going to change the topology of the network. You know, some some links between nodes are going to be broken, or the weight you know associated yeah. on, to that link is going to get weaker, and this may change the dynamic too. So. So it's not just that it's not inconsistent, but also we may be able to better understand how, to the extent that government interventions and voluntary behavior change explain the dynamic of the epidemic, we may be able to uh, explain it better, understand it better if we take into account population structure. And to go back to your question, um, I think another difference it makes from the policy point of view, in addition to the fact that it should just um, uh, strengthen the point that, you know, uh, policy doesn't matter nearly as much as many people assume. But another, I think, uh, possible implications is just that we should maybe start collecting the kind of data we need to test the theory I was talking about, you know, so data that would allow us to reconstruct the network on which the, the virus is spreading. Because yeah. this, if, I'm, if I'm right, this is the only way we are ever going to be able to make projections that are not completely terrible, like the ones we've 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 seen so far. So there is a real uh, effort that would be necessary, you know, to to collect the kind of data that modelers modelers would need to project to make projections that are not completely completely awful and yeah. so so that's another you know, way we want to get government practice. disability and data because you know the, the way i've seen it i mean we've proven to be very very incompetent every part of you know how western countries have responded to this from you know the the, the their uh, the npis to the you know the, the vaccination which they don't put, put enough em emphasis on to the npis which they put too much emphasis on to to their rhetoric you know i, I just think that giving them any excuse to sort of meddle anywhere. So, you know, they're meddling now based on this homogenous mixing. So they just say, you know, we're not going to let people go outside. If you tell them, oh, it's more targeted, they might go and say, okay, we really have to go after dinner parties. We really have to go like to family gatherings. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, so I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I think, yeah. Uh, look, it may have this implication where we're dealing with competent people who we could trust to. Yeah. 
to make good use of that stuff. But, uh, but you know, we obviously aren't dealing with this kind of people. And, you know, of course, relatedly, there are issues about privacy here, you know, the protection, you know, I, I don't trust, you know, I mean, you know, when I, you know, like you're in the US, you know, I see all the FBI has been behaving, you know, virus, virus episodes. And I'm like, do I want to give the same government, you know, a way to like, you know, have enough like fine grain data to reconstruct, you know, people's like minute behavior and yeah. like who's they see when, etc. Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, I mean, you know, not only as you said, is it not clear that they will use this to make better decisions as opposed to even dumber decisions? Yeah. But also, you know, they may use it to make not just dumb decisions, but you know, down the road, like, like clearly, like malevolent ones. You know. So yeah, I think that's, that's I, possible. I, I, yeah, I think just letting them think it's all behavioral change. I think, you know, yeah, for probably, I mean, truth is, what is truth and what is propaganda is, you know, often different things like the anti-vax stuff. Like some people, like it's obviously stupid, but some people say, look, you only have like, you know, society can only have two equilibria. It's like overreaction or underreaction, yeah. right? And so you, if you want to oppose masks and you want to oppose lockdowns, you sort of have to accept the anti-vaxxers, you know, um, sort of into your into your coalition, or at least not go after them too much, because the idea is, well, you know, it, it, it's one or it's one or the other. We are, we we don't have enough. We're not smart enough, you know. As public intellectuals, we could say whatever we want, but if we were political yeah, activists, I, I, we you know we have I, to think I, more carefully about this. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good point. You know, you have like it's something that is almost always completely ignored in those discussions. You know, we're we're having this discussion, we're nerds and we're having those technocratic discussions about, you yeah. know, the ideal ways of doing things. Right? And we totally forget in those discussions that we're dealing with like real societies, you know, that are not made up of nerds who, you know, care about that stuff. And and you know, you have to take into account various like sociological and political realities when you when you uh, talk about that stuff, you know, when you, when you try to change policy really. Yeah. And, and I often struggle with this thing, you know, so like right now there's all this discussion, you know, about, um, you know, all those plans that people are pushing to, uh, make, you know, increase our capacity to produce vaccines, which, you know, in, in theory, I'm all for, you know, but I'm like, okay, in practice, I, I, I think that the likely effect, if we insist too much on that, those sort of plans, however, you know, sensible they may be, in theory, is that it's just going to further fuel the hysteria. And I think we've reached a point where, you know, really the most important thing is that we say stop, you know, like we have yeah. to, we have to realize that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. You know, I've, I've written something about this too for CSPI. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. There will always be new variants. Yeah. Okay. Some of them will be worse than the previous ones. Uh, there will be people will keep dying for this, but it won't just it won't be as bad as before, you know, like because the population won't be immunologically naive anymore. And at some point we have to stop because if we continue on this, you know, path and like uh like surveilling, you know, and freaking out every time there is a new variant and you know, putting everything on hold, it's it's just never gonna end because you know, as I said on Twitter, it's like you can't you can't win a race when there is no finish line, and there is no finish yeah. line here. It's always going to stay with yeah. us, you know. And well, so, the, the South um, Africa discovered the uh, the uh, the Omi uh, how do you pronounce it? Omicron, right? Omicron, yeah. Omicron. Uh, they, they they and so some people were so then there was a uh, shutdowns. Uh, there was a uh, shutdown to travel between Western countries and South Africa and some other nations in Africa. And some people were like, "Oh no, you're punishing these countries for having good surveillance." And I, you know, and I, I tweeted the other day, "Well, like maybe yeah, we really should. Good. Maybe it's good because like we don't want to discover new variants because we're going to yeah, it's like that. it's like so it's it's definitely unfair to South Africa because yeah. you know they well, did the right thing, awesome. etc. Yeah. Like, but maybe you know." Maybe what we need is that maybe we need maybe we should thank our leaders for being so stupid and doing that because, yeah. like as you say, you know, it will maybe create the incentives for other countries to no longer do this kind of genomic surveillance, so we can just stop like obsessing over this stuff because yeah. this is the only way it's ever going to stop. Is if we do this, you know. Another point I made is that I don't think people realize this. You know, again, you know. It, it was different at first because the population was immunologically naive to the virus, which means that nobody had, had the specific immunity to it because they had never been, ex it was novel, you know, uh, nobody had, had been exposed to it. And, uh, but, you know, now with the vaccines and infections and natural infections, 
uh, it's different. You know, most people have some kind of immunity against it, and so it doesn't do as much damage. And one one point I made too is that look, uh, even in the worst, what I consider the worst case scenario, which is that from now on, from now on in in a country like France, you know, a country of like uh, sixty seven million uh, people, uh, it kills fifty thousand people a year. To be clear, I don't believe for a second this is going to happen. Like th- this, uh, this would mean like much larger waves all the time than 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 seems plausible based even on what all is already happening right now. But um, but even if you if you make this assumption, what it would mean basically is that if you look if you take the the previous trends of mortality reduction, it would just take it would just mean that we lose like I don't know between 5 and 15 years worth of mortality reduction at previous trends. It's okay, it sucks, you know. I agree it's it's very unfortunate, but it's yeah. not the end of the world, you know. It's like so we're we go still back, we go back to like 2010 life expectancy in a western country yeah, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you know. So and, and then it's and then when you get back we're going to stay on the same trend, you know. It's going to it's going to keep going back, you know, uh, re, uh, go going down, you know. Yeah. So so, you know, the point I make is like, look, I, I agree. I'm not, you know, COVID deniers. as people, I mean, people, I don't like this expression because people use it for everything, you know, but like including stuff that is perfectly sensible. But, uh, uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm not denying that this thing has had a real impact on mortality and like, and, and that it's going to keep killing people. You know, I'm not one of those people who think that it's going to magically disappear for some reason, you know, uh, but but you know you have to get a grip basically and like get a sense of realities here we're not talking about the black death you know that's going to keep coming back for like centuries and yeah. and like you know carry off you know one third of the population yeah. or whatever so let's, so let's talk directly about uh, omicron so we're recording this on uh, november uh, 29 2021 you um you're going to publish uh, i think soon the uh, piece on the the reaction to this this new variant um i don't know if it's it might, may or may not be out by the time uh, people listen to this but you know what have you seen so far and i i think that you know when i've seen the reaction i've seen the discovery of this uh variant uh seems to sort of i mean i think you, i think you called exactly what would happen so can you talk about that a little bit yeah i mean you know i, I wrote this post on uh, delta's transmissibility advantage and i, I explained you know, in this post i made some conceptual distinction and to explain how people were what people are doing how they were doing how they were estimating the transmissibility advantage of of those new variants and and i you know i explained that um if you're using this methodology uh Every time there is a new variant that's like taking over, uh, just because of the way it works, you know, people can read that post. Uh, it's called, I think it's called, uh, is Delta really more than twice as transmissible as the original strain? I mean, you can mm. find it on, on CSPIO's website. Mm. Uh, and uh, if, if you use this methodology, every time there's a new variant, just because of the way this methodology works, automatically you're going to infer that uh, the variant, the new variant is like X times more transmissible than the previous one, which means that it's going to be even more and more transmissible than the original strain. And I made this joke, which wasn't just a joke. You know, it was it was literally, I was explaining what was going to happen if they keep using this, that method, because that was the logical uh, conclusion, is that eventually I said there would be, there would be a, an omega variant uh, and people and you know epidemiologists will will conclude using that same methodology that it has a basic reproduction number of 125, at which point you know will dawn on them that maybe this methodology is not particularly reliable. And we're here, you know, we're we're here now because they've looked at the so the way this methodology works basically they look at the growth rate of the new variants and compare it to the growth rate of the old variants, and you know uh, of course if the new variant is taking over it has a much higher growth rate. So if you use this difference in growth rate to estimate a transmissibility advantage, uh, you're going to conclude that it's much more transmissible than the previous one, which itself, for the same reason you had concluded, was much more transmissible than the previous one, which itself was much more transmissible than the original strain. All the way you go back to the original strain, and you end up with the... It just compounds, basically. So if you use this methodology, eventually you're going to find like ridiculous conclusion like the one I was making up, but no, it's happening, you know, no, they're yeah. saying stuff that implies that uh, Omicron is like as a basic reproduction number of something like 45, you know, so that means that 
uh, in a, an entirely susceptible population, on average, a person who is infect, infected by this variant is going to infect 45 other people, which, of course, is complete lunacy. It's not, you yeah. know, and they know it. No, no, no you know, they're not going to say this. You know, they know that this is ludicrous. We've reached to the point where we've reached high enough numbers and even they, even the epidemiologists are going to be like, no, okay, we're not going to, you know, of course, this is not true. What so about, it has to yeah. be immune escape or, well, at least some of them, you know, like some. What about the headlines? I, I, think, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, the U.S., I mean, the, the, over, the reaction has not been as bad as I thought. I mean, I, don't, I haven't heard of major municipalities or states uh, enacting new restrictions. Biden said, now everyone, if you're crowded indoors, wear a mask. But he just said it. Nothing has happened. Thankfully, so far, this could change, you know. At any moment, uh, what, what do you think of those headlines? Have you looked into this? The claims that they say you know it has all these mutations, like four mutations or yeah. ten mutations. I don't remember the so, number. It all make I, a difference. I, I, yeah, it, 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 seems, it seems to me. I mean, on, on the transmissibility front, you know, I think the same as before. You know, people are using this very flawed methodology, and so you can't really draw any conclusion about the transmissibility from the kind of data they're using. Yeah. It was true before. It was always true. How do they get that mutation, the, the number of mutations? Like, what no, are the, the mutation, the mutations. Uh, so this is interesting. I think it's true that, uh, you know, what they found basically is that this stuff has a lot of mutation, which is weird, you know, like it, it probably either, it seems that either it must have been like uh, evolving in some place where there is no genomic surveillance, like so, you know, some African country, probably uh, north of South Africa, where you know there was no genomic surveillance, so it had it had had plenty of time. You know it doesn't descend from Delta too, so it mm. descends from a, a much earlier uh, lineage of the virus. Mm. So basically, one possibility is that it evolved. You know separately, it accumulated all those mutations uh, undercover. You know nobody noticed it because there was and no. Then, you know, it was in a country that, and then you know eventually it reached South Africa, and then it was picked up. Or another possibility is that a, some guy you know who was immune, you know, was battling with the virus for a very, very long time. So that gave the virus to accumulate those mutations in this guy. And then he infected someone else uh, with it. And then, you know, it, it, it is good. So what is true is that there are some good reasons based on the mutations to think that this variant is going to be more transmissible and better able, even more so, even more importantly, better able, which is different, better able to uh, uh, escape prior immunity. Because basically, it has lots of mutation on the spike, and we know that antibodies really like to target the spike. And so uh, you can use those computational models and to predict how well they're going to be able to bind. And you know, it's not perfect. And I, I, I mean, I don't know this literature very well, but I've, I've read a little for uh, the stuff I wrote on on uh, the endemic transition. And so you know, but it's still it's it tells you something, and it seems that. Uh, it looks as though you know antibodies are going to have a harder time uh, binding to this the spike of this variant, and so this suggests that it will be better able to evade uh, prior immunity. No, I think that it will mostly be it will mostly weaken protection against infection, and it will still be well protected against severe disease, because you know antibodies are not, as I explained in that post, it's not the only thing. Uh, that our immune system, the only weapon that our immune system has to fight off uh, infection. But, you know, it's kind of like one of the first line, one of the first lines of defense. So it means that probably it will be easier for even people who have been vaccinated or infected before to be infected again by these variants, although mm. they should still be protected by against severe disease. But, you know, it's very early to say we, we basically have no data at this point. You know, I've heard this, people are quoting this uh, uh, medical official in South Africa saying that it was... Uh, apparently, she's been only, also she's been co quoted out of context. But even if she hadn't been, you know, like I, I don't even believe, I don't believe that even the South Africans have enough data to to really know anything about how virulent this strain is. So maybe yeah. we're going to be lucky and it's actually pretty mild, and that would be perfect because that would be the combination. You know, if it's also very good at uh, evading immunity and or very transmissible, that would be the perfect combination because. It would quickly replace the other strengths, but would be relatively mild compared to them. And yeah, so, that's one explanation as to why it went undetected, right? The people are not getting that. That's, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's one possibility. But you know, I think really we don't know. Uh, I think you know there is no point in freaking out about this because if it's really more transmissible, and or you know so good as, as at evading uh, 
uh, uh, prior immunity, it will be everywhere soon, and there's nothing we can do about it. So you know, uh, there's no point in figuring out. But you know, and again, we have very good reasons to think that we'll still be protected against severe disease, yeah. even with this variant. So yeah. people should just chill out and stop, you know, freaking out. Yeah, best uh, advice. I mean, is if you're, yeah, yeah, best advice is still get vaccinated, and then. Yeah, the same. It's the same. If you're yeah, old, the same get a booster. Always. If you're young, probably get a booster, but it doesn't matter. And that that's that's all. That's that's been the TLDR of yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah vaccines basically. are good, and everything else is is really not not necessary. And yeah, you're wasting yeah. you're wasting your life. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's sad. It's sad. I, I think I hope you know. It's like you have to just you just have to have the politics to have the attitude of like, I'm not going to listen to these experts. It's like, you know, it's like, it's nice that we sit here and we say, you know, they need to have better science and, you know, we can do this for intellectual reasons. We're providing a, a service or providing knowledge to people who care enough to look about, to look at data. But in the real world, you know, I, I'm afraid they're just going to keep freaking out forever. And all you could do is just have political resistance to it. And, and, and that's, and that's it. Um, you know, every time we talk about this, we talk about sort of the the politics of and, uh, what's going on. So, what's going on in uh, France now? Are you guys? What are what are the restrictions? How is how is life? It's, still um, so now, uh, we, you know, we have this uh, vaccine passport. We we already had it, you know, but now everyone is going to have to have a, a third dose in order for to validate this for for this thing to stay uh, valid, you know. So uh-huh. otherwise, you can't you can't go to you. you basically, you're is it a QR uh, code? Where, where do you show it? Do you show it everywhere? Yeah, yeah, it's a QR. It's a QR code, and you know, if you don't have it, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to a gym, you can, you, you basically almost, you can go to a cinema. You, you basically can't have a normal social life. Groceries? Uh, you can go to great groceries. No, you can go to groceries. That's the, one of the few places where they don't, they don't uh-huh. ask. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think this stuff is ridiculous. I mean, I think you know, at this point, most people have been vaccinated. You should just like let it go. You know, if people, some people want to be want to uh, uh, risk, you know, getting ill because they don't want to take a vaccine, whatever, you know, like, I mean, you know, I, we need to stop, you know, and, you know, that's not the only thing, you know, we are, uh, we're bringing back, you know, I, I mean, uh, masks were already mandatory almost everywhere indoors, but there were some places where there was like uh, some uh, um, leniency or, you know, some place where even it was removed, you know, it's like, so at school, you know, primary schools, um like in some departments, you know, about half of them until recently, uh, kids didn't have to wear a mask. No, they're bringing them back everywhere. Oh, wait, so France uh, still had mask mandates for indoor, indoors. Uh, we, in public? we had them. We yeah. had them in some in some uh, primary schools in some departments where you know the incidence was above a certain level. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. And uh, and you know, in uh, I guess Frozen, in the US, you would call that junior so, high so right school. Now, so right now in Paris, uh, do you have to wear you have to wear a mask if you go somewhere in, uh, in public? Uh, not not outdoors, but they said that they were not ruling out doing it again outdoors. Which, if they do, I mean, no, I was already not like wearing a mask outdoors. I will never w- wear a mask outdoors yeah. again. You know, I don't like, wear like, policy like, enforcement. If you go to the grocery store, like I go to the grocery store here in LA County, I'm often the only one, or maybe there'll be one or two or three other people. And most stores, except Target, Target bothers me, but everyone else, um, they usually and uh, they and uh, anywhere that's owned by uh, uh, Asian immigrants. But basically, everywhere else, like they don't say anything to me. Um, in, in, so in, in France, it, it depends where you are in France. In Paris, it's definitely enforced in supermarkets, for instance. Uh-huh. Uh, in the gym, for instance, I was telling you. So in the gym, I wasn't wearing it. You know, it's 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 this gym story. It really illustrates how crazy we have become. You know, yeah. like in theory, the rule was that when you're not using a machine. So either when you're coming in the gym or coming out or moving in bet- between machines, you were supposed to wear a mask, uh-huh. but not when you're on the machine, which of course uh-huh. is ridiculous. Yeah. You're in a room full of dozens of people who are sweating and breathing hard for hours. Yeah. So yeah. you're basically, if some of them are infected, you're swimming in virus, yeah. you're literally swimming in virus and you don't have a mask for most of the time you're there. But the 1% of the time when you're, that you're not on a machine, you're supposed to put the mask on, which is going to have zero effect, you know? Yeah. yeah, you know, if someone was infected before, but and and before, you know, before this omicron like scare, and uh, it's not just. Oh, no, what the, about when you're weightlifting? Yeah, you, just the machine. You have to. You can't. You don't have to wear. No, no, you, you don't have when you're using a machine. You or you know, even what weightlifting, you don't have to wear. Yeah, no, no. When you're exercising, basically, you don't have to wear a mask. Okay. Uh, 
And, and uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't lift weight, so I just I only use the elliptical. That's why I talk about the machines. But, uh, and um, but uh, yeah, you don't have you don't have when you're exercising, but you don't have to to wear yeah. one. And yeah. before before recently, before the recent you know government's announcement, where you know they they made several announcements, like they brought back the mask in a number of settings. Uh, and they, people, uh, but people, but people in the gym. I'm still interested. People. So I found a gym here in LA County where they don't make you wear a mask, and nobody wears mask. And I feel very, very lucky to have to have this gym. Um, and so, I, I, so how do they? So they enforce it? Will they? Will because I think, so, I think in the so, U.S. I think people who own gyms tend to be a little more right wing. And I don't know so, if you have the political so, polarization uh, uh, until until a few until a few days ago. You know when the government made this new those new announcements because of the wave that's growing here and now with the Omicron stuff, uh, Omicron stuff. Um, uh, it was the rule, but it was absolutely not enforced. But I would no. say that um, two thirds of people, which you know, which is much. Uh, less than in the subway because in the subway everyone wears a mask. I mean, because you're all in part because they're scared of wearing a uh, of getting a fine, but that's not the only reason for reasons I'll I'll mention later. Uh, but at the gym, I'd say about two thirds of people were wearing wearing a mask when they were not exercising anyway. Uh-huh. But you know, like I wasn't doing it, and there was I would say there was a good third of people who weren't doing it, and they weren't enforcing it. But now since the I don't think this will last, to be honest. But at yeah, least, like a, a, as of a few days ago, after the government's new announcements, like I, I, you know, I came in without a mask as usual, and the guy, you know, at the <laughs> the guy at the entrance was like, "Oh, you know, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to ask you to wear a mask when you're not exercising now because you know we're afraid." Basically, what he explained to me, so he was like, he agreed that it was ridiculous, yeah, but he explained to me that they were afraid that there would be an inspection from the government and they'd get fined or closed if, if they didn't enforce it. So, but I, you know, my, my prediction is that uh, pretty quickly, at least after the big wave is, is falling, you know, pretty people will just like stop, but you know, will stop, you know, worrying and they will stop enforcing it. But my worry is that if it keeps, if the wave keep growing, I worry that f- the French government is going to do the same thing as ma- many European governments are already doing. Uh-huh. Which is bring back the heavy restrictions, you know, like uh, curfew, lockdown, all that stuff. And you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow a fuse if they do this. <laughs> I get. Yeah, yeah I was like, shocked. I was shocked when Austria went into lockdown. I think one other country, either Slovakia or Slovenia, one of them, I think, uh, also went into lockdown too. Yeah, this Slo- Slovakia just did it. I think uh, in the Netherlands, looks like they're they're gonna do it. Uh, I mean, they've mm-hmm. already brought back some restrictions. Uh, in in uh, in the UK, in the in the UK, they had been pretty good. You know, they said we're going to stop this stuff. You know, and uh, and they had uh, uh, they had actually done it. You know, even though they they have they just, brought, had, they, like, they just they just brought back masks. I just yeah, that's they what they did. That's what I'm going to say. You know, but for four months they had very high incidence, and yet they didn't cave. You know, they didn't bring back any of the restrictions, including masks. And now they just did it. You know, so everybody's caving in the end. Denmark, they had said the government had said. Oh, we're, uh, you know, it's, this is the end. We declared the pandemic is over. We're not going to use restrictions again, blah, blah. But they brought them back again, you know, like, so, Incredible. you know, in the end, they just have no, there's just like so much pressure from like the media and, and the doctors that you see on television and the radio all the time, you know, saying stupid stuff, you know, like the same nonsense that because they're, I mean, I should probably not talk about doctors because then I'm <laughs> you'll lose you'll lose it. no it's it's depressing yeah I think this is yeah I think this is the most wor- I mean the COVID COVID pandemic has been a uh tragedy but the reaction to it I mean has also been a, a tragedy it's been the greatest political you know this, this was the greatest health tragedy of uh our lifetimes I think the reaction to it has been easily the greatest yeah, yeah. political you, and social you, you, you said something in the post that I think was very true you know that that is also shocking me like it's something you you published recently i think where you were like it, it's kind of crazy when you see the reaction you see the things we do all those pointless rituals that we go through like this mass stuff at the gym you know yeah. which is completely pointless you know like or even worse the the outdoor masking stuff that you know honestly i uh, i think might come back in france soon uh because you know that's it, it never left up. here in los angeles you see it you see these idiots with yeah. their kids yeah covered in masks walking around, and, and, and around so, you, know, for blocks you, and you, blocks. you see and, and the point the point you were making is is something like you know that i don't remember the exact wording but that was the idea i said something similar on twitter it's like like if, if you had told me two years ago that, that we would do this you know i was 
I would never have believed it. I would never have believed it. It's so insane, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, recently I was reading Cal Harper's uh, the the fate of Rome, which is uh-huh. you know his great book on uh, the end, the fall of the Roman Empire, and specifically it's about the roles of pandemics and and climate change uh, in the end in the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh-huh. And and you know, it's really funny because there is this moment where he cites this. Uh, uh, all ancient author, I don't remember which one it is, was like was making fun of people who were like putting some magical formula on their doors to keep the the. Of course, they didn't know it was a virus at the time, you know, but basically to keep the the plague out, as they would mm-hmm. say at the time. Uh, and of course, the guy was uh, the, it was amusing the 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 author in question, but it was like you know, and some people say that the people who put the formula on their door actually. Uh, were more likely to die from the plague than the others, you know. So he was making fun of them. Of all, they have all those ridiculous, you know. He describes all those um, offerings they make to to the gods, you know, to Apollo in particular, uh, to implore them to spare them, and like, and you know, and I know that if I I, I read that like uh, yeah. two weeks ago, and I was like, I, I I read that stuff, and I was like, if I know that if I had read that three years ago, I, my reaction would have been, oh, those guys were so stupid. You know, yeah. They were, look how irrational their reaction was. And no, I see what we're doing. And honestly, it's just like, it's the same thing, you know. Of course, we don't sacrifice chickens anymore because, you know, that's not the yeah. uh, fashionable among the sophisticates anymore. But we do stuff that's very similar, like this mask outdoor stuff, you know. Uh, and, you know, really, y- you see how in many ways we haven't really changed, you know, and we in, in, and haven't really improved yeah. in particular. And, we've, and now, like, we, now we think we've improved. That's the thing. We think that... You know, whatever yeah. the leaders are saying, you know, Fauci, you know, you attack me, you, you attack science, he said the other yeah, day. Yeah. We, th- you know, we've gotten the hubris of science, you know, of scientific people without getting sort of any of the, or very little of the knowledge. And, you know, there's good, th- I mean, the, the development of the vaccines, you know, it's funny because it's, uh, you should, you, we know, should, maybe this is a bigger conversation, but, you know, the, the development of vaccines is just a triumph of a few companies and science and technology and markets anything more complicated that requires government like government yeah we supported the vaccine okay that's like a no-brainer right but anything beyond that anything that requires a little bit of you know smart leadership or like intelligence on the part of the larger society everything everything like that has been an absolute failure um, yeah i mean I- I, you know, I, I think, you know, I think obviously we're not, I was saying, you know, we're, we haven't changed. Of course we have changed, like, you know, they, they wouldn't have been able to develop a vaccine, you know, in the, yeah, in the course. second century AD. Uh, so of course we have changed in that sense. But my point was like, yeah, there are many things that haven't changed. And, and, uh, and yeah, you know, what you were saying is exactly right. Like, you know, we think we're much better, not just because of the vaccine, you know, if we thought we we're much better because of the vaccine, I wouldn't have any problem with that because, you know, that is the one thing that makes us much better. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, they think they're much better because we, we listen to the advice of like nonsensical papers, you know, that yeah. claim that, you know, the lockdown has like reduced transmission by 70%. But really what they do is what I described before, you know, it's voodoo magic, you know, it's yeah. voodoo magic for the, the I love science crowd, as I once wrote in a, in a piece on, on, on one of those papers, you know, just like, that's exactly what it is, you know, and people have this, it even has its heroes, you know, like, like Fauci that we're mentioning, when there's this kind of cult that's developing uh, around this guy, you know, on the liberal side, you know, or like worship him as if he were like, you know, sometimes it feels like it's like God, like talking, giving Moses the, the tables of the law on Mount Sinai. Yeah. And then you have like the opposite nonsense, you know, from uh, on the conservative side where they're going to, you know, they're going to put everything on Fauci. It's going to become this kind of like, and you know, I don't like Fauci. I, I think yeah. I think he's terrible. I'm not even saying that to defend him. I'm just saying, you know, he's just one guy who, of course, has had a, an important role, but really was just reflecting the 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 dominant yeah. opinion okay. among like public health experts, which was nonsense, but he wasn't special in that way. It's not as if, you know, you could have... You could have replaced Fauci by any number of those guys. It would have been the same. They're clones, you know? Yeah. And, but, you know, when you listen to, like, the conservative discourse, it's like, is this kind of d- special evil, you know, as if he were somehow different yeah. from the others? And I mean, that's not, the, that's not even the worst of, I mean, the conservative. Uh, yeah, no, that's not the worst I mean, of the vaccine stuff. Yeah, I mean, you have the, the vaccine stuff, but you also have, I mean, just the, the analysis. I mean, the analysis, when you look at conserv- some of the conservative analysis, I mean, if these people had power, they would be scary but they would be maybe less scary because you know letting you know depend if the if the 
if COVID was 20 times worse and say conservatives were the same and liberals were the same, where conservatives said, don't worry about it, the liberals were freaking out, uh, maybe the conservatives would be the greater evil because then we'd actually have to do a lot. Um, yeah. But now... Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah I, think, I think that's right. I think that uh, right now I would much prefer to be governed by the conservatives because even though they would do it for the wrong reasons, they would still be doing the right thing, or at least they'd be doing something that's okay. much closer to the right thing yeah. than what the liberals are doing. But you know, it's not that's not because they're smarter, you know. But uh, but whatever, I don't care about this. I care about outcomes, you know, yeah. first and foremost. And and right now, the outcome I really want is for us to move on, you know, and stop obsessing over this stuff. Yeah. And, and I guess I'm more likely to get with them than with the others. But yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think, yeah, I think this, so this is a fast moving situation. I mean, by the time people listen to this, it'll probably be, uh, there'll be new political developments, although we probably won't know uh, much. And maybe more. Omega will have arrived by then. <laughs> people will go on. Right. Yeah, the next few days. So, uh, yeah, um, do you want to, uh, you know, do you want to talk about what you're working on now, or do you want to just save it and surprise people when it comes? I think we should yeah, save yeah, it. Let's, let's let's save it. Let's save it. We can we let's, can talk okay. again. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll talk again before long. Okay, Philippe, been great talking to you. Yeah, you too.